2, Nehemiah 6, 15 and 16. So the wall was finished on the 25th day of Elul in 52 days, and it happened when all our enemies heard of it, and all the nations around us saw these things, that they were very disheartened in their own eyes, for they perceived that this work was done by our God. You know, some people's names need to be remembered. That's often why we erect uh, monuments and memorials. They help us remember people whose lives deserve to be remembered. That's why we have the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington, D.C. You have two black granite walls, each measuring 246 feet and 9 inches in length. They're engraved with over 58,000 names of those service members who died or remain missing as a result of their service during the Vietnam War. And their names are there so we won't forget their sacrifice. And then that's also why we have the National September 11th Memorial in New York City. Two one-acre pools with the largest man-made waterfalls in the United States comprise the footprints of the Twin Towers. And they are adorned with 152 bronze parapets on which the names of 2,983 victims are inscribed. And their names are there so we won't forget their lives. This morning, I want us to understand just how important it is to remember some names. And I think that's the purpose of the next chapter in the book of Nehemiah that we're going to examine. So turn over to Nehemiah chapter 3 because I want you to see a unique memorial that appears there. I know our reading came from chapter 6, but that's because I was kind today and I wasn't going to make Brother Hallbrook read a bunch of names. But Nehemiah chapter 3 is one of those chapters that, that I typically have skipped over in the past because it's legitimately a list of names. And anytime we come to a list of names in the Bible, it can be a hard read because we don't know how to pronounce these names that are foreign to our language. And it can be a boring read because it feels like they're just there for the sake of historical record because we, we know the Israelites loved their genealogies. But in this instance, we're not dealing with genealogy. In this instance, we come to Nehemiah chapter 3. And over the course of 32 verses, 48 different individuals or groups are identified as having contributed to the construction and or repair of the Jerusalem wall. And among these names, there are some details that are going to be worth mentioning because they teach us a great deal about construction workers. You see, this morning, we need to re realize that the Bible refers to you and I as construction workers. Hold your spot there in Nehemiah chapter 3, but consider this verse. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 9. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 9, Paul wrote, We are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. The you in this verse is a reference to the church in Corinth. So Paul refers to the church as God's building. The we in this verse is a reference to Paul and Apollo. So Paul refers to those servants who labor in the kingdom by planting and watering as God's fellow workers. And, and something we can take away from 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 9 is that you and I as kingdom workers have been given the ministry of reconciliation, a reference to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 18. And so like Paul and Apollos, we are God's fellow workers. Thus, we have a role to play in the construction of his kingdom. So today, we're going to look at these wall workers in Nehemiah chapter 3 so that we can learn about our individual responsibilities when it comes to the construction of God's building. And so, going back to Nehemiah chapter 3, I want us to take note of some of the details that are appear in this unique chapter of names because it speaks to who we ought to be as kingdom workers. Let's start with the first verse. Look at the first individual mentioned as a worker on the wall in Nehemiah chapter 3 and verse 1. 
His name is Eliashib, and he is identified as the high priest. And we're told that Eliashib, with his brothers, the priests, built the sheep gate. They consecrated it and set its doors. They consecrated it as far as the Tower of the Hundred and as far as the Tower of Hananel. Now this is significant because the high priest was so revered in the Jewish religion that no one, no one would have criticized him if he abstained from working on the wall. But Eliashib did not consider the work to be beneath him. Eliashib did not consider the work to be another's responsibility. Eliashib did not view himself as a supervisor over subordinates. Eliashib viewed himself as a contributor, as a worker, as a fellow servant of the Lord. He didn't expect the people to do something that he himself would not do. But what's really significant about Eliashib is where he chose to work. You see, he, along with the priest, rebuilt the sheep gate, as well as the wall adjacent to it. This was the gate that was closest to the temple. And therefore, it was the gate through which the animals were brought into the city and up to the temple mount for sacrifice. And as a result, this gate and this section of the wall mattered spiritually. It wasn't just an ordinary gate in the town. Eliashib didn't just walk up and say, okay, I'll take that one. Eliashib intentionally chose the gate that affected the relationship between man and God the most. Eliashib made an intentional decision here. He chose to work on the wall that benefited the people's relationship with God. And that's why this is the only section of the wall that was quote-unquote consecrated, that was set apart, that was made holy. And this is what's interesting. Eliashib's decision to work on this section of the wall is noteworthy Because according to verses 20 and 21 of this same chapter, he chose not to work on the wall adjacent to his house. Look at Nehemiah chapter 3, verse 20 and 21. After him, Baruch, the son of Zabai, repaired another section from the buttress to the door of the house of Eliashib, the high priest. After him, Merimoth, the son of Uriah, son of Hakaz, repaired another section from the door of the house of Eliashib to the end of the house of Eliashib. If you journey through this chapter, one thing you'll notice is that oftentimes builders or, or the people who volunteer to rebuild parts of the wall would build in association with their residents, but not Eliashib. Eliashib didn't worry about the wall around by his house. Do you know why? Because he prioritized the wall by the house of the Lord. Eliashib deliberately chose to work on the section of the wall that benefited the house of the Lord rather than the section that benefited his own house. And in so doing, Eliashib modeled the importance of prioritizing the Lord. You know, one of the most well-known verses in all of the Bible is Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33, which says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Although this verse is well known, it's not always well applied. What I mean is that many of us can quote this verse, but we cannot live it out in our life. And I believe Eliashib provides us with a tangible example of what Jesus meant when he said, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. That's because Eliashib placed God's interests ahead of his own, and in turn, God made sure that Eliashib's needs, particularly his need for protection around his home, were not neglected. We're called to be a people who are capable of laying aside our own interests for the greater good of the kingdom. Jesus said in Luke chapter 9 and verse 23 that you cannot be his disciple unless you're willing to deny yourself and follow him. That's the epitome of deprioritizing your own interests. And when we look at Eliashib, 
we come to an understanding that a godly worker deprioritizes his own interests, all so that he can prioritize the Lord's interests. So this morning, as we begin our journey through this chapter, ask yourself if you are willing, like Elisha, to deprioritize your will. Are you willing to be in second place so that God can be in first place? Does your life bear that out? Because if we want to be a godly worker, God has to come first. We have to come second. That's the first thing we learn. Look at Nehemiah chapter 3 and these workers of the wall. That's not the only thing we learn. Because if you'll skip down to verse 14, that will bring us to the second wall worker that I want you to pay attention to. His name is Malchijah. And in Nehemiah chapter 3 and verse 14, I want you to notice where we're told he worked. Malchijah, the son of Rechab, ruler of the district of Beth Hakarim, repaired the dung gate. He rebuilt it and set its doors, its bolts, and its bars. Malchijah worked on the dung gate. That's not a word we use regularly, but if you know what the word dung means, it means feces. It means excrement. And I'm being as politically correct up here with my terminology as I can without grossing you out. It's the dung gate. This gate is legitimately named this because it is the the avenue, it is the pathway, it is the exit from the city that led to the Valley of Hinnom. The Valley of Hanom was this, this valley outside the city that the people of Jerusalem used as their sewage plant mixed with their landfill. It's where everything that was disgusting, everything that needed to be removed from the community was taken. So the leftover food particles from meal preparation and from dinner are taken out through this gate. All of the leftover pieces from the animal sacrifices are taken out through this gate. And all of the excrement that is produced in the community is taken out through this gate. I want you to think for a moment. Do you think that was a pleasant work environment? The dung gate? I'm certain the sights and the smells that emanated from that area of the town and that that Malchijah was exposed to was not enjoyable. I'm certain that the dung gate was not the gate that everybody was lining up to work on. I'm certain that this was the one place in the city that everybody tried to avoid being responsible for. But Malchijah volunteers for it. Malchijah says, I'll take the dung gate. I think Malchijah demonstrated humility by willingly repairing the most disgusting section of the wall. And in so doing, he modeled biblical servanthood because he's willing to work where no one else wants to work. Malchijah demonstrates that a godly worker willingly does the unwanted work. You know, one of the most memorable events in the life of Jesus was when he washed his disciples' feet, which you can read about in John chapter 13. And this is a story that will come up in preaching with with a good bit of frequency, but let's remember what's going on here. In John chapter 13, Jesus and his disciples have traveled from Galilee to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. And they would have completed this journey that would have been approximately 70, 80 miles in length by foot. But you have to remember back then, they didn't have Nikes. They didn't have Vans. They didn't have Converse. They didn't have Sperry's and name your shoe, your on clouds or whatever. They didn't have these nice closed-toed shoes. They had these open-air sandals. Guess what? They also didn't have sidewalks or asphalt or or boardwalks, or any other hard surface like that to really walk on until you've gotten to the main cities. You might have some stone roads, but primarily they're walking through dirt and sand and that sort of substance. Their feet are filthy. And so a show of hospitality in any household was that when someone entered your home, as the host, 
as the owner of the house, the first thing you're going to do is wash their feet. Oh, well, actually, you're not going to wash their feet because you're the owner of the house. You're, you're, you're the one in charge. So you're going to choose the person that's of the lowest social standing in your home to wash their feet. It might be a servant. It might be your child. It might be your wife. Whoever is of the lowest social standing would be assigned that task. Well, here's the dilemma that Jesus and the apostles are in. They're not in one of their own homes. They've gone to a home that is borrowed. Someone is allowing them to use a room in their home. None of them are the host. And none of them believe themselves to be of the lowest social standing. In fact, if you read Luke's account of the Last Supper, you find out that an argument among those apostles as to which one of them is the greatest. When they're in this room and Jesus is taking off his outer garment, getting a, a, a towel and getting a water basin, the rest of the people in the room are arguing about who is the greatest. What irony is that? And then Jesus, the person who is the most superior of this group, the person who is the rabbi, that, who, the person that has brought this group together and that everyone else is following is the one getting down on his hands and knees and washing their feet. And Peter, Peter recognizes that this isn't supposed to happen this way. Peter's the one who objects. He understands that Jesus should not be the one down there washing feet, but is he getting up to volunteer and help? No. Jesus washes their feet, and then if you look at John chapter 13, verses 12 through 15, this is what he says. Do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher, Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. So Jesus deliberately fulfilled this demeaning task, then instructed his followers to do just as I have done to you. In other words, Jesus established a precedent that those who wear his name must be willing to do the unwanted work. And there's plenty of unwanted work to go around. So ask yourself, are you willing to do the dirty jobs? Are, are you willing to imitate the, the, the image of Christ here? Are you willing to be the one who takes on the most demeaning of tasks? Are you willing to do the unwanted jobs? Because that's the expectation of a godly worker. One who has no job too small, no job too dirty, no job too demeaning. A godly worker willingly does the unwanted work. If we keep journeying through Nehemiah chapter 3, we'll come to uh, another section down in verse 27 in particular, where we read about the Tekoites. Back in Nehemiah chapter 3 and verse 5, we read that the Tokoites repaired a section of the wall next to Zadok. But then in verse 27, we learn that the Tokoites repaired another section opposite the great projecting tower as far as the wall of Ophel. Did you catch that? The Tokoites repaired another section. They did not repair just one section, they repaired two They didn't settle for just doing the one section of the wall that was assigned to them. When they finished, they didn't just hang up their tools and find a comfortable spot to relax. No, they found where more work needed to be done, and they kept working. They put in overtime. Now, they weren't the only ones to do this. You can read about some others throughout the chapter who took on a couple of different sections of the wall. But they are unique in this regard because they were not residents of Jerusalem. The Tekoites are residents of the town of Tekoa, a town located 10 or 11 miles southeast of Jerusalem. So despite the fact that they're not dependent on the walls of Jerusalem for their protection, and they are not technically responsible for the repair of these walls, they're willing to work and to do overtime on the repair of these walls. 
So the Tekoites went above and beyond the call of duty. They did more than was required of them. They went, to use the words of Jesus, they went the extra mile here. And in so doing, they teach us that we must not place limitations or conditions on what we will or won't do for the kingdom. Have you ever done that? Because I have to admit, I have. Coming out of college, looking for a ministry position, I unintentionally was telling God, I will only work in the state of Arkansas. And here's the thing I've learned. Whenever I tell God consciously or subconsciously what I'm going to do, he laughs at it. Because I, I, I had it made up my mind, I'm not leaving the state of Arkansas. My first ministry job was in Pensacola, Florida. And I ended up staying there for 12 years. I also graduated college telling the Lord that I was going to be a youth minister until I was too old to do youth ministry anymore. Five years into my youth ministry career, I was asked to take over the pulpit at the congregation I was working at due to a, a church split. And I became a preacher. I remember as youth minister, when I had to fill in preach, when I got done, I would have people come up to me and say, you're going to make a fine preacher one day. And I would, in my mind, laugh at them. Hm, I'm never doing that. I'm never going to be in the pulpit. That was my mentality. I never wanted to be a pulpit guy at that time of my life. And now I've been doing it for 11 years. I was telling God the conditions on which I would serve him. I was putting limitations around how I would contribute. And I'm certain I'm not the only one who's ever done that. Who's consciously or unconsciously told God, I'll serve you in every way but this one. This is the one thing I won't do. I, 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 I will not participate there. I will not give my time to do this. I will not fulfill that role. I'm certain there's more than just me who is guilty of having done that. Do you remember our theme verse for this year? I haven't brought it up in a while, but I want to take you back to it today. It's 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 1. And it says, Finally then, brethren... We ask and urge you in the Lord that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. The New American Standard Version uses the phrase that you excel still more. Paul, writing to Christians here, acknowledges that what they're doing is good, but instead of telling them to just keep doing what you're doing, which is probably what you and I would say to them, instead of doing that, he says, excel still more. In other words, Paul is saying, hey guys, you're doing a great job. You're walking the way you ought to walk. You're doing what you ought to be doing. You're living the way that God intended you to live. But I challenge you to do more. In Paul's eyes, the church in Thessalonica was doing a great job, but that didn't mean that they couldn't do more. But oftentimes we say, I can't do that or I won't do that. And we need to realize that Noah never said, I don't do boats. Abraham never said, I don't do circumcision. Ruth never said, I don't do mothers-in-law. David didn't say, I don't do giants. John the Baptist didn't say, I don't do deserts. And Paul didn't say, I don't do mission trips. So who are we to say what we will and won't do for the Lord? See, the question we have to ask ourselves as we take a look at these godly workers and we come to the realization that a godly worker does not place limitations on his work, the question we have to ask ourselves today is, are, are, are we willing, like the Tekoites, to work without conditions, to work without limitations? Are we willing to go the extra mile? Are we willing to excel still more? Are we willing to do that for our Lord because it's His kingdom, not ours? Does that describe you? Someone who removes all limitations and all conditions on your service to the Lord, because that's what a godly worker is. And one final observation from this chapter. You have to go back to Nehemiah chapter 3 and verse 5 for this point, because what we'll find out is a godly worker does not refuse to work. Back in Nehemiah chapter 3 and verse 5, that's where we first read about the Tekoites. 
worked on a section and repaired a section of the wall there in Nehemiah chapter 3 and verse 5. But there's a little detail that shows up in that verse that's worth mentioning. And next to them the Tekoites repaired, but their nobles would not stoop to serve their Lord. This verse tells us that there were some members of the Tekoite nobility who refused to work. Now, why did they refuse to work? Several suggestions have been offered. One possibility is that they refused to work because it wasn't their problem. As has already been mentioned, these nobles were from Tekoa, which is a town 10 miles outside of Jerusalem. That means rebuilding Jerusalem was not technically their responsibility, so maybe their refusal to work was indicative of their refusal to accept ownership for a problem that wasn't their problem. Or another possibility is that they refused to work because they were afraid of repercussions. One scholar pointed out that since Tekoa was close to the area controlled by Geshem the Arab, and we'll be reading about him uh, next week, but he's one of three men who vehemently opposed the reconstruction of Jerusalem. Since their town was located close to this guy, perhaps the nobles were influenced by or afraid of him. Maybe their refusal to work was indicative of their fear of reprisals from one of the project's chief opponents. So maybe it was because it wasn't their problem. Maybe it's because they're afraid of, of somebody else. Maybe another possibility is that they refused to work out of a sense of superiority. That phrase in Nehemiah chapter 3 and verse 5, would not stoop to serve, is an interpretation of a Hebrew idiom that can be literally translated as did not bring their neck into the service of. It's a reference to a yoke being placed on the neck of an oxen, or of an ox for uh, work, and therefore it's suggestive of pride in the same way that the term stiff-necked suggests pride. So maybe that Hebrew idiom infers that these nobles would not work because they thought it was beneath them. A final possibility is that they refused to work simply because they were lazy. Uh, another commentator said this, This verse shows that not all the Jews were enthusiastic about rebuilding Jerusalem's defenses. So the possibility exists that rebuilding Jerusalem's walls just wasn't a priority to them. So maybe they didn't work because they were afraid of somebody getting upset with them, some other ruler getting upset with them. Maybe they didn't work because they were just plain old lazy and didn't want to have to do the work. Maybe they didn't work because they, it wasn't their problem, they didn't want to take ownership of it. Or maybe they didn't work because they thought the work was beneath them since they are, in fact, nobles. Regardless of the reason... The Tekoa nobles provide a contrast to all the other workers mentioned in Nehemiah chapter 3 who exhibited what one author called an overall spirit of collaboration. And from their poor example, we're reminded that a godly worker is one who willingly works, not one who refuses to work. Never forget what happened to that one talent servant in Matthew chapter 25, verse 25 through 30. Instead of using the resource given to him by the master to advance the master's estate, the one-talent servant lazily buried his resource. And when the master called him to give an account of what he had done with the resource entrusted to him, the servant said in Matthew, the servant said, in effect, I was afraid you'd be upset if I wasn't successful, so I decided to do nothing with it, so at the very least I could give you your money back. And upon hearing how this servant handled his finances, do you know what the master called him? Wicked, lazy, worthless. Wicked, lazy, and worthless, and then deemed this servant unfit to receive a reward, choosing to punish him instead. A lesson for us to glean from the parable of the talents is that laziness or slothfulness is unacceptable in the kingdom of heaven. God made it quite clear in the Bible that he created us for good works which he prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. We were created for good works. We were created to do good work. We are his workmanship. 
Paul's words indicate that God expects us to be active, expects us to be productive, expects us to work in his kingdom, and failure to do so is tantamount to laziness. And if the parable of the talents is in the indicator, such laziness can lead to eternal punishment. So the question you have to ask yourself today as you consider these nobles from Tekoa is are you refusing to work? Not just placing limitations, not just placing conditions on your work, but just outright refusing. Are you wicked, lazy, and worthless in the eyes of the master? Because if you refuse to work, the parable of the talents indicates that's how, that's how he views you. See, there's a lot we can learn from the workers in Nehemiah chapter 3. Realize this, that construction efforts are only as successful as the laborers who conduct them. You know, one of the biggest problems in the church today is that people don't recognize the requirement, the expectation of work. One evangelist pinpointed the problem with these words. He said, a great many people have got a false idea about the church. They have got an idea that the church is a place to rest in to get into a nicely cushioned pew and contribute to the charities, listen to the minister, and do their share to keep the church out of bankruptcy. The idea of work for them, actual work in the church, never enters their mind. See, when we go back to Nehemiah chapter 3 and we read about these workers, we see people who did not succumb To arrest mentality. In 52 days, that's just under two months, in 52 days, as Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 15 tells us, they finalized the construction of a wall that is estimated to be over a mile in length. And I'm not sure about its height. But why were they able to accomplish such a great feat? Well, Nehemiah summarizes it in chapter 4 and verse 6 when he says, The people had a mind to work. So I want you to close out today by thinking about this. What will be written next to your name when the history of God's church is finalized? See, Nehemiah chapter 3 gives us a memorial of the people who worked on the wall. In the history of the church, if a chapter was written on the people who contributed to the work of the God, kingdom and its expansion throughout this world, would your name make the list? And what would be written next to it? That's the question I want to leave you with today. Because we're all called to be workers. If you're not a part of the Lord's family, if you're not a part of his construction crew, then this morning is an opportunity for you to join the team. And you can do that by confessing your faith that Jesus Christ is the risen Son of God by repenting of your sins and being immersed in water for the forgiveness of those sins. Whether you're currently on the team or not, we invite you to respond to the invitation today while together we stand and sing.